At dawn on the morning of the 6th of June, 1944, 225 Rangers jumped off the British landing craft and ran to the bottom of these cliffs. Their mission was one of the most difficult and daring of the invasion, to climb these sheer and desolate cliffs and take out the enemy guns. The Rangers looked up and saw the enemy soldiers at the edge of the cliffs shooting down at them with machine guns and throwing grenades and the American Rangers began to climb. When one Ranger fell, another would take his place. When one rope was cut, a Ranger would grab another and begin his climb again. They climbed, shot back, and held their footing. Soon, one by one, the Rangers pulled themselves over the top, and in seizing the firm land at the top of these cliffs, they began to seize back the continent of Europe. The teamwork and determination displayed on that fateful day at Point du Hoc not only demonstrates the best of the United States Army, but it also represents our mission at the Association of the United States Army. Soldiers supporting soldiers. For almost 75 years, AUSA has served soldiers, providing a voice for the Army, and celebrated those who have helped the Army community. We've experienced tremendous growth and are now over one million members strong and growing. We continue to provide essential services to soldiers, civilians, retirees, veterans, and family members. We engage with the Army, Congress, industry partners, and communities across the globe. And we work to advance national security and promote greater recognition of the Army's vital role in American life. But we're not stopping there. We're evolving the way we educate, inform, and connect America to the Army. We're developing our Center for Leadership to inspire Army leaders. We're investing in our Army communities with a broader membership reach. And we're building stronger links between generations to support the Army's critical needs. As we charted AUSA's path for the future, we realized we needed a new symbol to represent what we do a logo inspired by the significance of the soldier experience and the Army story. A logo inspired by our focus on people. Because, as General Creek Nabram said, people aren't in the Army. They are the Army. A logo inspired by the achievements of those brave soldiers at Point du Hoc on that fateful day in 1944. This is that emblem. AUSA, it takes a team. Soldiers, families, civilians, retirees, veterans, industry, and you. The Association of the United States Army is pleased to welcome you to AUSA's new report webinar series. This webinar series features presentations by senior Army leaders responsible for key programs and initiatives. It also features contemporary military authors who weave together the past, present, and future story of the United States Army. Kicking off today's webinar is AUSA's President and CEO General Retired Bob Brown. And welcome to the Association of the United States Army's Noon Report. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We appreciate your support as partners in the defense of our nation. Joining us today is General David Petraeus, U.S. Army retired and co-author of Conflict, The Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine. Please take advantage of having General Petraeus here to ask questions. You can use a question and answer tab on the right side of your screen to submit a question. And after the discussion, we'll take as many questions as possible. 
And you can find the full bio for General Petraeus in the handouts tab. General Petraeus will share his exploration, exploration of over 70 years of conflict, drawing significant lessons and insights from this fresh analysis of the past. And General David Petraeus, U.S. Army retired, is one of the leading battlefield commanders and strategists of our time. He served over 37 years in the U.S. military, starting with his graduation from the U.S. Military Academy in 1974. He has a Ph.D. from Princeton and has held academic appointments at five universities and is in addition to his current position as a Kissinger Fellow at Yale University's Jackson School. He is also currently co-chairman of the Woodrow Wilson Center's Global Advisory Council, senior vice president of the Royal United Services Institute, and a member of the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, and Aspen Strategy Group. I don't know how you have any free time. Well, you <laughs> Unbelievable. Didn't, and you didn't even mention my main job, exactly. which is a partner at KKR. And exactly. Chairman of the KKR I couldn't if we went Institute. through the whole bio, the show would be over. Exactly. Yeah, so, but thanks for well, joining thanks. us. No, the privilege really. is mine, and thanks for what you did in your 38 years in uniform and have done for now several years as the president of AUSA. Oh, thanks. It's my, it's my honor. And Well, what a... Uh, what a fantastic book. First of all, I'll tell you, I was going to take my time reading it. I said, you know, and uh, ended up about two or three days. I couldn't put it down. And, and I said, I said, Gee, I'm only going to really highlight the key parts. And as you see, it's almost all tabbed. So there's it's a lot of great info in there. How, how did it come about? How this idea with, with Andrew Roberts, Lord Roberts, uh, uh, what led you to this? Well, I've known Andrew for a number of years. Uh, we've e interviewed each other on various stages in New York City. I did four or five of his Churchill book alone. Mm. It was just so enjoyable. He's uh, a delightful a individual. Yeah. He's a brilliant uh, historian and yeah. biographer. Uh, and then he'd interviewed me in a number of different mm. locations uh, in the UK over the years. And he called up after the Russians invaded Ukraine and said, you know, there should be a book that provides the military historical context mm. for this. There isn't one. Yeah. I said, would you be interested in doing that with me? Uh, and I said that I would because I'd been keen to find a vehicle in which I could recount at least my perspective mm. uh, of the war in Iraq and then right. war in Afghanistan, having commanded both of those and having done Iraq as a two-star, three-star, four-star, right. and then CENTCOM and then even right. later CI right. director. So, um, and then I wanted to revisit Vietnam, which was the subject of my PhD dissertation mm. uh, at Princeton decades earlier. And so much had been declassified, yeah. more scholarship, more memoirs oh, that, and that so must forth. must have been so, fascinating to go so back great and look at that back. again, yeah. And I was eager also to lay out, I'm sure we'll talk about this intellectual construct right. of strategic leadership that I developed actually when I was the CAC commander, which you also right. were, yeah. before going back for the surge in Iraq and then doing CENTCOM in, in Afghanistan right. CIA, where I used this explicitly. Um, he's a delightful guy to work with. Mm. Uh, and uh, so we pitched the book and Harper won it yeah. uh, at night, very nice advance and so forth. Remember then they asked us, you know, so how do you intend to divvy it up? Hey, I was wondering and, that. Andrew, yeah. Andrew said. Have the historian do all the research. Kind and, of, hopefully. Well, <laughs> you know, because this is his 20th book. Yeah. But it's actually yeah. my first other than yeah. the PhD dissertation and arguably the counterinsurgency field manual. Right, right. So uh, he, he quickly responded, well, General Petraeus is going to write about the countries he in, invaded. and <laughs> Plus Vietnam, and he said, I'll fill in the rest. Uh, but we had a wonderful oh, wow. collaboration, literally yeah. sent many, probably tens of thousands of emails back right. and forth during the course of the right. writing of the book. And well, we just finished the second edition, ah. uh, just submitted that, which adds a chapter on Gaza. Oh, and excellent. And of course, it brings Ukraine up to date as well. Right. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, yeah, it's, uh, you know, you look at 70 years, it would be very daunting. And, but I, I like how you chose only those conflicts that led to some evolution. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Again, it had to be somewhat significant in a yeah. certain way. Uh, it was interesting that that I added a handful mm. uh, that I don't know that he would have picked up on. Uh, for example, the uh, El Salvador, for example, which I right. got to observe. I spent a summer right. as a special assistant to the commander in chief of U.S. Southern Command, General mm. Jack Calvin, who I worked for three different times over mm. the years. Uh, we also added in Oman, which I think is one of the classic uh, counterinsurgency campaigns where the British helped the brand new Sultan mm. overthrew his father after mm. he graduates from Sandhurst and yeah. then wins a war. And there's a delightfully titled book by a, a then British brigadier. He ultimately was the DSAC year when yeah. I was a SAC year's speechwriter. Uh. 
and the, the book was titled "Only a Brit Could Do This." We, we won a war, and, and and they did. And I remember taking that yeah. book in and said, "Could you please inscribe yeah. this to me, DSEC?" Oh, wow. Here, yeah, that's great. But it was great fun. Uh, we yeah. again enjoyed it thoroughly. Had great fun uh, on the book tour as well. We yeah. started in the UK, did two and a half weeks there, and in Europe, wow. and then came here, and uh, and it was pretty intense for oh, a that, period that's of time. Great. Well, one of the big themes. Uh, is, as you mentioned, the strategy, and I really enjoyed the four parts, uh, you know, get the big ideas right. Can yeah. you kind of go Let through? Let me talk about that. Sure. That, that comes yep. out across the book, and I really enjoyed how, uh, you know, for different conflicts you see that's sometimes usually not implemented well, but uh, and kind of rare it's, when it is. It's so, a determining factor, really. Yeah. I mean, the big yeah. conclusion, the big takeaway, people ask, what do you want people to take away from the right. book? It's the importance of strategic leadership. That's the leadership mm -hmm. at the very top. Of course, it begins with political strategic leadership. Mm -hmm. So it's George W. Bush or George H. W. Bush saying after Saddam invades Kuwait, this will not stand. Mm -hmm. That's a big idea. Big idea. <clears throat> and then the yeah. military, which actually was not that enthusiastic if you go back mm -hmm. in the history. Uh, General Powell, of course, had Powell's rules. There was an uncertainty. The mm -hmm. lessons of Vietnam were still ringing in their head. Right. Uh, but the minute the president says this will not stand, okay, we got our marching orders. And then he and Schwarzkopf yeah. do a brilliant job together yeah. in a way. Uh, providing the a strategic great success leadership. story of yeah. that, yeah, but, no doubt. But again, between the three and four star tours in Iraq, sitting out there at Fort Leavenworth doing the counterinsurgency right. field manual, overhauling every aspect of our preparation of units, equipment, right. leaders, staffs, and everything else for uh, deployment to Iraq and also Afghanistan, mm -hmm. I determined, laid out this intellectual construct for strategic leadership. Mm -hmm. Having been told, frankly, that I was going to go back to Iraq, mm -hmm. I ended up going back a bit earlier than I thought. But it consists of four tasks. Uh, first, you have to get the big ideas right. Mm -hmm. You have to craft the right strategy. Mm -hmm. You have to really understand the context, our forces, their forces, the enemy forces, the human terrain, the physical mm -hmm. terrain, all the elements of society, Makes the sense. neighborhood, everything else. Right. Um, then you have to communicate the big ideas, communicate that strategy mm -hmm. uh, throughout the breadth and depth of the organization and to everyone else who has a stake in the outcome of the conflict. Mm -hmm. You then have to oversee the implementation of the big ideas. This is what we often think of as leadership, really. Right. It's the example right. the leader provides, the energy, the inspiration, mm -hmm. the attracting great people, hanging on to them as long as right. you can, developing them, allowing those not measured enough to move on to something else. It's the organizational architecture that you design. Mm -hmm. You know, we all learned that there's no one size fits all in, in these conflicts right. in which we were engaged. Right. Um, we were constantly tweaking them. Actually, we got it pretty seriously wrong in the beginning in mm -hmm. Iraq after mm -hmm. toppling Saddam's government with the CPA and all this mm -hmm. pickup team and revolving door. Uh, so uh, it's also the metrics that you use. Right. You know, as we recount, the body count was the wrong metric in right. Vietnam because we had the wrong right. strategy in Vietnam Right. <clears throat> until late 1968 when General Abrams finally took over. Um, it's also how you spend your time. As you well know, the battle mm -hmm. rhythm of the guy at the top, this is how you drive the execution of a campaign plan. Right. The meetings you have, the frequency of them, the substance of them, yeah. <clears throat> all of that. What do you do Time every? What do you do yeah, every day yeah. of the week? Yeah. What do you do several days a week? Twice mm -hmm. a week, we would go out as a four star. We would get in a vehicle or a helicopter or a plane. We'd go out and link up with the unit on the mm -hmm. ground, go on patrol with them, then sit down with the company commanders afterwards and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's all of this. Again, everything you do every day, all the way up to the quarterly six hour right. uh, civil military campaign plan review with, with the right. ambassador and all the other ambassadors and generals and people right. coming in from CENTCOM and, and from the Pentagon and so forth. That is crucial. And in that battle rhythm, you have events and meetings mm -hmm. that facilitate the performance of the fourth task of a strategic leader, which is to identify how you need to refine the big right, ideas right. to do it again and again. As you <clears throat> recall, we have lessons learned teams all over the battlefield, mm -hmm. Army, <clears throat> Marine Corps, Special Ops, Asymmetric Warfare Group, Counterinsurgency Center, all these. One of the events I had every month was they'd get to pitch me, the full colonels, mm -hmm. lessons that needed to be learned. I actually mm -hmm. threatened to rename that. It yeah. wasn't the Center yeah. for Army Lessons they, Learned. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, they're not learning the lesson. No, no. It's not learned until it's actually incorporated exactly. into big ideas, right. communicated, and then implemented. Right. So, but I said the signage would cost too much so that you can you can stay <laughs> call. I don't care as long as you don't have any, right, any illusions right. about you learning You've lessons. Actually learned learned. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what you're doing is identifying. And then you do it again and again and again. By the way, yeah. this works in the, in the civilian world. Right. You know, KKR, we own 120 right. companies around the world. Right. Some of them own 120 as well. Axel right. Springer, for example, right. we have minority interests, another 100. Right. This strategic leadership's the key. 
Right. And, you know, if you don't get all aspects of this right, you end up like Kodak, which actually right. had over 2,000 patents on digital photography wow. when it was the king of film photography and services, yeah. but failed to make that yeah. the new big idea early yeah. enough. Others got there and they've never oh, been the same. Fascinating. I could do this with Netflix. There's yeah. a, in a description with right. Reed Hastings, all right. the major big ideas that he's had. It's yeah. absolutely central. Yeah. And again, if the strategic leaders don't get the big ideas right in yeah. particular, uh, that effort is probably doomed. Yeah. Uh, and there's a number of cases in there, of course. You know, think of the French Dien Bien Phu. Right. That's a seriously bad big idea. <clears throat> no uh, they didn't get yeah. it right in Algeria either. And right. as I, we argue in the book, it took us 13 years mm. uh, from the time we came in after the French, after the partition of mm -hmm. Vietnam into North and South. And the South Vietnamese asked us to help them with security in the villages and hamlets. Mm -hmm. And we said, no, no, no. Let me let us tell you what you need. Right. We're, we're fresh in the battlefield of right. Korea. Right. You need, you know, eight divisions. Right. And we're going right. to help you build those. And right. you guys, the little stuff, villages and hamlets, you can deal with that. Yeah. Well, that was, you know, they didn't yeah. have security for the people. Yeah. And it yeah. wasn't until April. And then General Westmoreland turned it into the big war, thrashing around in the jungle. Right. I reread We Were Soldiers Once and Young, yeah. which I'd read. You know, right. he was, of course, an air assault battalion commander, right. for first air cav. Right. Helicopters in the battlefield, Idrang Valley and so forth. And I'd read it as a lieutenant colonel mm -hmm. commanding an air assault battalion in the 101st Airborne right. Division. But I was what I was looking for was, again, leadership lessons learned, yeah. tactics, techniques, and yeah, procedures, exactly. how, all this stuff. Exactly. And this time I looked at his reflections, which I'd sort of breezed over. Right. And he wrote, for example, that, well, the Battle of the Idrang, you know, they killed nine or ten of the enemy for every one of them. Right. Uh, and he said General Westmoreland thought that was a great victory, a great exchange ratio. He said, on reflection, I'm not sure America's mothers and fathers agreed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then later, as a brigade commander, uh, even bigger battle, even bigger casualties on either side, they take control of this territory. Uh, they turn it over to a, a quite good Vietnamese unit. Right. And the enemy's back in there in three <clears> weeks. <throat> so exactly. it highlights the ephemeral results of these efforts that were going on. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to, again, living with the people as the Marines did with their CAP mm -hmm. program, which mm -hmm. was actually quite successful. Right. Uh, and one that General Westmoreland didn't like, actually. He wanted them to aggregate their units and right. go out and do the right. big war. Uh, and yet we could not win a war of attrition mm. with North Vietnam. There was never going to be the crossover point that was briefed by McNamara and others. That's fantastic. So finally, yeah. Abrams, yeah. in late 1968, develops, crafts a true comprehensive right. civil military counterinsurgency campaign. Right. Uh, the CIA doing their operations, uh, again, at, at local levels and mm. so forth. The embassy all integrated, uh, but it was just too late. Too late. They did make yeah. great progress. There actually was yeah. quite an achievement. There was a real opportunity. Uh, but ultimately, of course, at the end of the day, once Congress essentially cut off the support and we couldn't provide the air power, uh, then it was, it was doomed. It must have been fascinating for you, uh, having done your yeah. doctoral thesis mm -hmm. on the Vietnam to go back and see it later with more information very much from so. a different perspective very, very as much well. So. Yeah. yeah. And all the additional reflections yeah. and memoirs and, yeah. and the declassification of papers right. Right. Uh, as well was, was just fascinating. Well, it was fascinating as you were going through the, the four tasks of the strategic leader and they're, they're fantastic. But I was thinking as you were going through it, each one of those in my mind, I'm thinking that's exactly right. Oh, wait a minute. I remember how hard this is because of these reasons. Each one of those is very, so very hard. difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And it, especially it, getting yeah. the big ideas right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and then if you have to change a big idea yeah. very dramatically. Yeah. And, I mean, the, and with think, the politician, well, you have political the, strategy sure. with the military sure. and how you're balancing that. Sure. You can have, I, I don't, and this we can, uh, this is one of the questions I see already from the audience about that. I'll, I'll get to in sure. a minute. But what surprised you the most? Having gone through that concept, but you, you know, from the conflicts you saw on that strategic level leadership uh, in, in all these 70, what, yep. you know, and why? Well, look, I, I think it's that, you know, I lay this out. It sounds easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's really not. Really and not. as you yeah. dig into this, yeah. there are numerous episodes where yeah. that first task is yeah. Is performed. Yeah. Sometimes they're doomed uh, right from the start. The big yeah. idea is wrong. Think about what yeah. we did right after the toppling the, the uh, Saddam Hussein regime. Yeah. Uh, we had, there was no real preparation right. for it. The Organization for right. Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance. I remember asking down in Kuwait, I was right. a two star then, right. 101st Airborne Division commander. I said, anybody got any final questions yeah. at the final? I said, you know, just could you get a little more detail after what <laughs> happens after we topple the yeah. regime? Yeah. And, and it, 
deputy said, Dave, you just get us to Baghdad. We'll take it from there. Yeah. <clears throat> I called up from Najaf. Yeah. I remember calling uh, General Wallace and I said, hey, I got good news and bad news. What's the good news? Well, we own Najaf. What's yeah. the bad news? We own Najaf. What do you want us to do with it? <laughs> he said, why don't you call those, guys, do from, call yeah. those guys at from Borja who yeah. said, and let's practice it in a small city. Yeah. This is the first major city that's actually been liberated. And right. We own it. Ben Hodges right. is now, you know, the mayor of, right. of Najaf. Right. And so first there was no answer. Right. Then finally you got through somehow and, and they said, basically, we're still getting organized. Well, right. Of course, then the regime is, is toppled. And yes, it goes faster than was expected at the final yeah. with the extraordinary yeah. uh, thunder runs and so forth, uh, the Marne division. Right. Um, but Orha just can't seem to get traction. Mm -hmm. So then it's replaced by coalition provisional authority. You know, yeah. one of the big ideas should be don't use pickup teams. Establish right. an embassy right here, exactly. right now. Exactly. Use the Army Corps of Engineers, yeah. use the Defense Contracting Agency, use existing organ which we right. did all right. of that when General Casey came in and then right. Uh, right. The first ambassador, uh, but we but, yeah. it was we wasted fifteen months yeah. or sixteen months, yeah. and the first actions of the coalition provisional authority head, uh, Ambassador Bremer, yeah. uh, let's fire the military, huge, mistake. and and don't tell them how we're going to enable them to provide yeah. for their family. This is hundreds yeah. of thousands of huge young mistake. men with weapons and yeah. training, who now their incentive is to oppose the new block right. rather right. than to support we, it. We've, we almost forced them into yes. the insurgency. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so five yeah. long weeks, I remember yeah. at the end of this, I flew down to Baghdad, found the guy responsible and says, we've got to de yeah. declare stipends. Your, your policy is killing our troops. Right. And so we did that, but we'd lost literally mm. almost two months by the yeah. time it was implemented. Yeah. Yeah. And then to compound that, you do debathification, which means basically everybody down to level four yeah. of the Bath Party, right. Saddam's party to be sure, right is fired right. and they're no longer allowed to work in government. Right. Well, there's no other, as you well know yeah. from your own time in Bozal, no other. there is no other really yeah. Yeah. significant job yeah. outside of government in a, in a Nor did they have a choice like the that. ones that they had to be a part of. It. And yeah. there was no reconciliation of right. the process. That's right. really the issue. Right. As you may recall, we got authority in the North, Ambassador Bremer mm -hmm. gave me an exception to try mm -hmm. out reconciliation, which mm -hmm. we did on an industrial strength scale. Right. Right. But unfortunately, Right as after we left, uh, yeah. the uh, Dr. Shalabi in, in Baghdad, who was the head of the de yeah. uh, debathification, uh, refused to agree. Yeah. Who refused to, and, and, you, and you had to deal yeah. with some of the challenges yeah. that, sure. that associated with that. Right. But again, those are two horribly bad right. big ideas. Right. Uh, and we needed level four, which was tens right. of thousands of bureaucrats most of them Western educated, mm -hmm. we needed them to help us run a country we right. didn't understand sufficiently. Right. Right. So uh, again, yeah. what astounds me, how can we do again, some really wrong headed stuff at times. And then the third bad big idea was again, having a coalition provisional authority right. instead of the embassy. And the only, right. the only j reason for that, that I can actually divine was that Secretary Rumsfeld wanted to run Iraq rather than have it have to compete with an embassy. Yeah. And so yeah. by having the CPA, which reported to him, right. rather than the State Department, right. Right. Uh, that he could have put his fingers on this more. Uh, and, and so it kind of leads to, as you, you know, the big idea is wrong. You see this in the book quite a bit. You're kind of doomed from the beginning if you don't. If you don't get the big ideas right. Yeah, you, yeah. It's, it's if you don't extraordinary. get back on track yeah. quickly, yeah. Yeah. it's, it's yeah. almost too late yeah. as a Vietnam yeah. example. Yeah. 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 There's some late. others yeah. also where you can actually have quite good strategic leadership. Yeah. And the other side, not as good. And I'd, I'd say, for yeah. example, President Zelensky uh, <clears throat> yeah. and, and the leadership yeah. in Ukraine right. versus Putin, who you know, that's a, completely that's a great misjudged. In here. Yeah. The problem is there's still a reality. There's yeah. a context. And the reality right. that Ukraine is grappling with right now, uh, in addition to this six-month debate that yeah. took place in the House, which had the pipeline is dry. And I've been to Ukraine three times in the yeah. last nine months, yeah. uh, including just a few weeks ago for a week. And it felt very tenuous right before mm. the House finally approved this. Mm. But the reality that they confront is that they're fighting someone who has a population more than three times their size and an right. economy more than 10 times their right. size right. and is seemingly unconcerned by casualties. Yeah. And yeah. that's a difficult concept. Yeah. And so, yeah. and then if your biggest supporter temporizes for a period of time, they're quite vulnerable right now. This yeah. is a fragile point yeah. until that pipeline gets refilled and the, right. the air defenses in particular and then artillery and, and other systems are in right. place. Yeah, there's they're in a bit of vulnerability right now. And that's the complexity of all four parts of that, it, because there's some parts of that they've gotten just been brilliant. As they have been, the strategic leader has been brilliant it, with the big ideas, but it, well, look there at, are other factors. If you test him, yeah. you know what's his first big idea? Right. Um, right. 
I don't want to ride. I want ammunition. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to yeah. stay in Kiev. Right. My family's going to stay in Kiev. We're going to fight for Kiev. Yeah. We're, As appo opposed this to like is our Afghanistan, war. look yeah. what happened. Yeah, yeah exactly right. Couldn't get out there fast yeah, enough. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, so yeah, you exactly. have that dynamic. Yeah. His communication skills. I mean, after right. all, he was an actor. He was a comedian who yeah. played the president so well <laughs> in a comedy that he gets elected president. Yeah. And his, you yeah. know, remember his pitch perfect yeah. communication to yeah. Congress, to the House yeah. of Commons, uh, the, the Bundestag, all of these. Uh, and every night to his own people. Yeah, uh, overseeing a pretty good Churchill with an iPhone. Churchill yeah. with an iPhone. Exactly <laughs> yeah, right. Was, uh, and, exactly. And he is. You know, exactly. Just really well yep. done. Yep. Yeah. And then, yeah. so really quite good performance. Yeah. Now they've had some issues that they've had to grapple right. with the right. their conscription law, yeah. uh, which is completely different from ours. You know, mm. the average age of the soldiers we were privileged to lead in combat was probably nineteen to right. twenty-two or so right. in the front lines. Right. In Ukraine, it's over 40, yeah. and they haven't had a rotation policy. So mm -hmm. those are out there have been, yeah. been doing this almost yeah. continuously for two years, yeah, depending on tough. where they are. Right. They finally, after months of emotional debate in the rod of their parliament, they finally passed a, a new conscription law that mm. reduced the age from 27 to 25, because they believe young men should be able to get an education, start right. a family, and so right. forth. And no, then and only then do they get called right. up. So they've reduced the age. They've closed some other loopholes and, right. and, and other mm. issues, address them. Mm. But they've got to get on with force generation right now because what yeah. Russia is doing with the money that they have, uh, they are offering huge enlistment bonuses, huge death payments in the rural communities. They're not doing mm -hmm. this in Moscow and St. Petersburg. The elites yeah. are largely untouched. Yeah. Yeah. But it's out in the countryside, and they're signing up for those big bonuses. Yeah, yeah very, uh, very interesting. I'm going to go to some good uh, questions sure. coming in from the audience that relate to the strategic level. One from uh, Colonel Retired Kevin Benson, a oh, I know brilliant well. strategist great, great himself, man. Sam's instructor, great, Sam's, yeah. great guy. Great, uh, but uh, I'll try. To, he's it's, it's it, exactly as we're talking about here. He says General Petraeus, based on your education and the range of field experience you have, do you think it is still practical? To, de to develop and execute a strategy from an objective derived from policy, such as the national security strategy? Or, given the state of the world, are we at a point where we must meet crisis with, uh, and, and with a series of tactical actions that are continually assessed and adjusted, all aimed at achieving military and political conditions for whatever the extent uh, policy objective may be at the time? You can tell he's a Sam's guy, and you know, it's a great he question. Is. No, it's it is a good question. So, in other words, you, you know, and, uh, and this is where, where that, the military Kevin. is kind of blaming yep. the political. Yep. And, well, maybe we need to adjust and be more flexible. It's a great well, question. Well, first of all, yeah. I think you, again, you do have to have big ideas. Yeah. Uh, you really yeah. do. And, yeah. and those, you set on those. Those are the foundation for the actual strategy, which, of course, is ends, ways, and means eventually. Right. But it starts with, again, getting the strategic big ideas right. Mm. Um, Sometimes we don't do that perfectly. Uh, there yeah. were periods in Afghanistan yeah. where I yeah. felt that this was 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 difficult. Um, yeah, I, you know, I had the privilege of serving under two different presidents, commanding two different wars. Right, and I can tell you that George W. Bush's support for the surge in Iraq was just complete. He, was, you know, every Monday morning, seven thirty to eight thirty, the way Washington started this week was around the national security table with the president at the head of it, mm. uh, going directly to Ambassador Crocker and me out there. Mm -hmm. You know, I, he. I said, Mr. President, your, your military is not doubling down. We're going all in. Yeah. Uh, and he said, he'll have the rest of government go all in with us. Mm. So you have that total. Yeah. And, yeah. and really quite a bit of latitude, frankly, too. Right. You know, nobody said, here are the big ideas right. you need to implement. Right. Right. They knew right. that we had them. It had to be a comprehensive civil military counterinsurgency yeah. campaign. You have to secure and serve the people. That means you have to live with the people. Yeah. We reverse what we've been doing 180 degrees instead of consolidating yeah. big bases yeah. going back in. Yeah. Uh, promoted reconciliation, pursued the irreconcilables even more mm -hmm. relentlessly, all of that. So, again, I think that's a strategy. And, right. you know, that's big ideas. Then you turn it into a strategic campaign plan. It was not as easy in, in uh, Afghanistan for a couple yeah. of different reasons. One is that you have NATO. Right. So you're dual-hatted as a NATO, <clears throat> and, and, and you're reporting on that. And, right. and that has its complexities. So it's not just a U.S.-led multinational right. force. Right. It's a NATO. But you also have the U.S. hat, um, and, and occasionally you're, you're – getting pulled in, in directions. And we didn't have quite the same commitment there, yeah. frankly. Yeah. Uh, and then yeah. there was a difference on how fast the yeah. surge forces should be drawn down. I, right. I, uh, my recommendation was get all the way through the second fighting season. Yeah. We didn't quite get there. Right. In, in that, right. That, and then from there on out, I think the drawdowns, which in Iraq were based on conditions. We had conditions in Afghanistan 
but it started to become Washington conditions right. more than it right. was battlefield conditions. So but again, we, to answer yeah. Kevin's, yeah. I, you know, I think you have to have the right being. Think about, right. just think about the <clears throat> overarching uh, strategy for the right. Indo-Pacific and for China, yeah. uh, where you, you're, yeah. you're forced our command. Um, essentially, it is that we need a comprehensive, mm -hmm. all the tools in the toolbox, uh, integrated, whole of governments with all our allies mm -hmm. and partners uh, approach <coughs> to China. Uh -huh. That's just the biggest of the big ideas. Yeah. And then you look yeah. at the individual components. We're generally doing that. Right. Uh, and we've right. gotten some of them back in the fold, the Philippines, right. Uh, right. Japan's right. doubling its defense spending right. in five years. Right. You have AUKUS. You have, there's a lot going yeah. on out there. Yeah. There is a glaring absence. It's the absence of a trade component. Right. Uh, we should not have walked away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Right. Right. Uh, there is the Indo-Pacific economic framework or whatever, but mm -hmm. every time it edges into real trade, mm -hmm. uh, there's a little bit of a, of, of a pushback. Yeah, no, no, so, but yeah. in general, yeah. I mean, uh, so now Big ideas Kevin, again. Kevin yeah. rightly can then right. say, can you craft a real strategy out yeah. of that? In general, I think that is going on. I, I know the Indo-Pacific yeah. commander who just took over, I just yeah. hosted him here, and his predecessor I met with regularly, and they really, over the course of the last three or more years, have transformed Indo-PACOM yeah. into much closer to a theater at war right. than it was before. Right. Both of them know CENTCOM. They know what an, right. a theater at, at war looks like right. with a you know, fully functional CAOC, all the components, mm -hmm. et cetera. They've done a lot that is not in view, frankly. Right. And, and right. I'm not going to go into the details on it, but right. they have crafted... They've right. got the big ideas, which right. were not in all cases in place. You know, who's right. going to be right. the, the joint task force? Who's going to be supporting, supported? Yeah, that makes How, sense. What, yeah. what are we doing in the Pacific Deterrence Initiative? What are we mm -hmm. doing with respect to Taiwan? What are mm -hmm. we doing with our allies? All this. There is a lot more joined up uh, as a result of, again, the and last that, three years of the indo That really commander. makes sense. It's great examples mm -hmm. because your fear with what Kevin's saying is, the military would kind of be out of the big ideas, and that could be very dangerous. I think they have to has, take the big ideas to. and then work closely with. It has to. Uh, they have to be big yeah. ideas. It looks sometimes or, yeah. the military almost can drive it. Yeah. Because if you think yeah. about it, the capability of the joint staff or of a, a theater command yeah. uh, of one of our yeah. combatant commands is so enormous. Right. Uh, right. You've got so much in the way of resources that you can actually enable, sometimes influence. Yeah. Yeah. support yeah and you you can convene yeah. uh you know we, great, great the point. only yeah. convening uh that would go on out in the yeah. aor was what we had to facilitate because we had the planes mm -hmm. we had the con you know we have all the assets right that you can bring together and that so i think sense. i remember for the invade the invasion of haiti uh mm -hmm. in the whole haiti operation i believe it was then lieutenant general west clark as the j5 who didn't see the interagency tackling this quite the mm -hmm. way it might have. Mm -hmm. And so he starts convening meetings. Mm -hmm. And he's bringing together right. the interagency. Right. And you know, I mean, there's a big brain and a huge energy and everything else. Right. Right. Uh, and the joint staff is so enormously capable. Uh, and then eventually, the yeah. NSC staff says, hey, what's going on over yeah, here? Yeah, that's well, a great why don't, point. Why don't that's we, a great we'll example. take a handoff from yeah, you. Yeah, uh, almost actually, leading up with yeah. the strategic idea. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. And then and they, they, they actually did that, develop a, a real yeah. strategic plan for that, actually, yeah. which it didn't, it wasn't executed in full. Be dangerous not to have that, yeah, no doubt. But, it, but it, yeah. you know, and then you had PDD-56, which yeah. is Complex Interagency Emergencies or something right. like that right. title that right. came out of that, which wasn't always executed all that yeah. well. But, yeah, exactly. And I, I ended up as the chief of operations for the United Nations Force in Haiti. Yeah. I was strictly a blue beret, not dual yeah. headed. Uh, I remember you that. followed. It was very that. interesting. I yes. was with the 25th yep. uh, Major, yep. and, uh, and yep. you were uh, involved, yep. came yep. out, got, got to escape the war college early. I don't know how you did that, but you came actually, down, we're helping us with actually, elections and I stuff. I had already escaped the War College because yeah. I was doing a fellowship at Georgetown. Oh, yeah, that's right. Which yeah. I wanted you to do because I was an army yeah. of one there. Yeah. I was only one yeah. person there. Right. No structure, and I could right. do what I wanted. I was helping the yeah. NSC staff with the initial uh, lessons learned of the initial part of the, yeah, that's the operation, right. which that's you were right. engaged in. And yeah. then I ended up going as a plus one of the Deputy right. Secretary of State, believe it or not, right. to the right. big meetings that they held. Right. And all of a sudden, General Joe Kinzer calls up yeah. and says, hey... 
I just fired my J3. Uh, How would you like to do Haiti instead of studying (laughs) Haiti? And I said, as long as you get me credit for the fellowship, you get me credit for the work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So he he checked with, uh, I think it was General Sullivan or someone, and they said, okay, yeah, let him go. And it was quite an experience, actually. Yeah, that's Um, great. And by the way, we lived with the people there. Right, right. That was one of the determinations was all the the U.S. wouldn't go outside Port-au-Prince and Cap right. right. So I said, all the subsequent coalition members, we're going to go out into yeah. the countryside. Yeah. And that will enable us to push the special forces even further out. That's a great And point. it was all about living yeah. with the people. And, it, yeah. you know, there was nothing like the violence we experienced, but right. there was a lot of crime. Right. Um, yeah. We also got the U.N. to agree to allow us to intervene in Haitian and Haitian violence, which actually was not right. in the rules of engagement right. for the right. U.S. That was a challenge at first. That, yeah, that that was, that was, that's impossible. Yeah. You can't yeah. stand there and watch right. violent right. actions. Boy, this is uh, this is a as, as I said, I couldn't put the book down because we could talk about this for days. This well, is so you know, we, it's our lives. It's, we yeah. lived it. We, yeah, uh, and it's so really forth. fantastic. And, and it's so much fun to go yeah. back and reflect and you know yeah. do the research. And you didn't have time before, you know, and not that you have a lot of time, free time now, but you, you know, you, you, you managed to work more, it in more than you did. Yeah. We have another question from Pete uh, that uh, it looks very good. As he said, "Sir, first, thanks for joining us for the noon report. As you discussed the big ideas." Where did you see the use of AI in future issues? Uh, will AI play a bigger role uh, in decision making as we move forward? And that that's uh, very much uh, so. probably one of my favorite chapters, the future much war so. chapter yeah. in yeah. here. So that's yeah. a great question by Pete on that. Look, I don't know, Pete, how much you, I use it all the time yeah. already. Yeah. Uh, as we're examining issues, the very I don't do searches anymore. I go immediately to the the AI tool that's either available on Google right. or on Bing. Right. Uh, and I really enjoy it. And I yeah. and you ask ever more complex questions, right. which helps you get sort of the first, second level of analysis. Mm. Uh, and then you can start to dig in and, and, and get it more specific. But it's an incredible tool. Yeah. So uh, it could it, help, it, it, it help educate to get the big ideas right. It, I, th- I think it time. will help every aspect yeah. of this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it can write the speech for you or right. your first draft right. in the communication right. piece. It can. Yeah. Uh, it it is already writing code. Yeah. So yeah. you don't have to do the laborious part of the code. Uh, but you've got to get what, the you, algorithm right. Well, you also you know, have a little to, bit of knowledge. You, you've there. got to label yeah. it right. You yeah. have to train yeah. it right. Right. You have to feed right. it the right information. Right. Um, what you need is it's called human in the loop. You can actually the machine can val- verify. Uh, a, grade it and so yeah. forth and catch yeah. errors yeah but but it will make some of its own right. the human will have some errors but right. if you can use human in the loop uh, data annotation and, and labeling and so forth yeah. uh and then of course you have to have the right expertise for that mm-hmm. and i'm actually by the way i'm also a personal venture capitalist i'm investing yeah. in about 28 yeah. startups uh multiple rounds many yeah. of them one of them is is ai it's revolutionizing how call centers operate yeah yeah. So first, you don't do a call anymore, which right. we all hate because we're told, right. please hold your calls important to right. us. It's right. it, it's a text message. Right. The machine watches a million text messages and digests them and sees the response by the mm. human, and it can start to do the first response. And it mm. just keeps getting better and better yeah. and better. And, yeah. and, and frankly, humans can do other stuff than, yeah. than call centers then. Uh, it, you still need humans, certainly a, yeah. a base number for the more sure. complex interactions. That's, that's a great but example. It's, that, yeah. it's phenomenal. Yeah. And again, AI is going to do this in every single uh, right. endeavor. I look at it as the speed of decisions, you know, and you look at it, it's going to be so well, important. It, and AI it can, will help you make the it, decisions it, faster. Well, look, eventually it's going to make the decisions yeah. because what's coming. And you'll be overseeing it. As, as you yeah. saw in the, in the Future of Warfare yeah. uh, chapter, what we say, and this is simplistic, but right. this is roughly what's going to happen. We have right. to transform our forces from a what might be described as a small number of Large platforms, some yeah. enormous, heavily yeah. manned, yeah. incredibly cap- exquisite right. capabilities, right. exorbitantly expensive, right. but increasingly vulnerable. Because right. if it's above the surface of the water, right. remember there was the adage in NATO that we used to recite, yeah. if it can be seen, it can be hit. It, it, if it right. can be hit, it can be killed. The right. truth is we couldn't see all that well. That's right. And if That's it was right. moving, we couldn't hit it. Yeah. All this stuff about the depth of the battlefield and yeah. all that, we, yeah. that was much more aspirational, frankly, yeah. compared with what we can do today. Yeah. But now everything today, can be seen. Everything can be you seen. Can't hide. It's yeah. harder to yeah. defend it. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, on, you have to land still a little bit, but to a degree. Still, but to a depend, degree, depending but on what the terrain is and so forth, and, yeah. and, you know what the yeah. foliage is and so forth. Yeah. yeah. Uh, underwater still to a yeah. degree. Yeah. yeah. But so you have to transform from that. Mm-hmm. You keep some of it. They're, right. they're important, but right. from that to a massive number of unmanned systems. 
that increasingly will not be remotely piloted. Yeah. They're going to be algorithmically piloted, if you right. will. And so right. and it's going to benefit from AI. They're going to continue to learn. Exactly. And the human in the loop becomes the human on the loop. Yeah. The human who actually designs first determines the, the tasks, the conditions, the directions that need to be given right. in, in the algorithm. Right. AI will help write that algorithm. Uh, and then uh, actually identifies the conditions that must be met before the machine on its own takes a kinetic or non-kinetic right, action. Right, right. You know, you know, people draw back from that and they say, oh my gosh, it, the, the, yeah. the human should stay in, well, if the human stays in the loop, you're going to be too slow. Yeah. And remember, in air defense and ballistic missile we, defense, the human is while. out of the loop. Yeah. When you go yeah. weapons free, the machine is right. going to determine. Right. And, and as these get more and more complex, you look at the yeah. uh, many, you know, well over, uh, number of drones and yeah. missiles and so forth that Iran shot at, at <clears throat> yeah. uh, Israel, yeah. um, you're going to have to have the machine not only be able to identify them, detect them, but then coordinate who takes which one exactly. and, and yeah. engage them in the yeah. most efficient yeah. and effective manner. Yeah, no no doubt. And then the good news is that's a key part of multi-domain operations and Exa exactly. I mean, moving so, to the yeah. future is exactly. a critical yeah, part That's what it is. It, no yeah. doubt. Another yeah. great question here that uh, Johnny B sent in. Uh, he says, uh, how does our Army better identify, train, and develop potential strategic leaders for the highest level of command kind of earlier? We've right? been Great grappling question. with this for years. Yeah. And, um, and I've often been asked myself, because I did have the privilege of exercising strategic leadership mm. and with a reasonable degree of success. Right, right. <laughs> um, and I, I do think that some of the experiences that I benefited from most were a little bit off the beaten track. Exactly. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, doing a PhD at Princeton. Right. I had two years. Really, right. Uh, right. I was told I was committing professional suicide right. by being out of the net. Ended up being six yeah. years because I did the staff college, two years at Princeton, two years teaching at West Point, right. and then a year as a speechwriter for the SAC year. Right. Um, and you know, obviously that didn't happen. But I, I had a real fork in the road. I could have gone to the Rangers yeah. or I could have gone to yeah. to Princeton. I'm certain you used that from Princeton in every job. You it was in. unbelievable. It was, it was the yeah. most out of my intellectual comfort zone right. experience in the world. Right. You know, I'd come from the staff college where we thought we were having big debates. Right. You know, right. should you have, I don't know, you know, 100 nuclear <laughs> missiles or yeah. 150 yeah. Uh, yeah. or what have you, or the ground equivalent. You go to Princeton, as people believe you yeah. shouldn't have any at all. Yeah. And in fact, yeah. you should have not or no first use or all. So these exactly. are big debates. Yeah. And I learned that there are seriously bright people in the right. world right. who see the world through a different prism right. and come to very different conclusions. Right. And that really prepared me when I was on the ground in Iraq right. for dealing with, you know, again, people that see the world very sure. differently, worship differently, uh, govern differently, <clears> and so <throat> forth. But I also picked up really great basic big ideas on... Uh, economics, which we actually implemented, and then also in political theory and right. so forth. So, right. and we came, you know, the big idea for the the council in Mosul, which you had inherited, yeah. it was the first one in all of Iraq, uh, was we want a, a provincial council that will be representative of and responsive to uh, all of the elements of society uh, mm -hmm. in Nainua province. Uh, there will be majority rules but there are definitely minority rights because, yeah. of course, you had so many minorities. Yeah. I mean, that's the ethnic exactly. and sectarian and tribal and political fault lines mm -hmm. of all the Middle East seem to run through through Mosul. So uh, that experience was extraordinary. I had these vantage point experiences, aide to the chief of staff of the Army, also assistant executive at the same time, speechwriter of the SAC year, executive the chairman of the Joint Chiefs for right. two years. Again, great <clears> experience. Again, did a fellowship instead of Georgetown, then deployed instead right. of the fellowship. These All these... We're just, I think, very, very so for formative. the future, identifying them. There's no cookie cutter solution, that's for sure. I don't think and some so, of these things that uh, that broaden our key. I, I think I it's the broadening. The same and, experience. And I do with think the, the education. You know, yeah, I think the education yeah. is very important. Yeah. And, and frankly, again, to do it in a civilian setting. Right. Right. To try to make these as much of an out of your intellectual comfort zone right. experience as is possible. That's and, very and developmental. You can, and then learn communication skills along the way exactly. as well. And I think you can identify those. I remember getting in an argument with the joint staff. They said, you know, you couldn't identify a strategic leader until they were lieutenant colonel. And it's absolutely wrong. It's too late. It's got, when they're captains, you can oh, identify you, these. You, like, they, they stand out. Yeah. And so then get yeah. them those I mean, there's a certain yeah. common feature. You know, yeah. they, they usually have a reasonable brain, reasonable yeah. desire, quest for, for right. learning. And so, I mean, H.R. McMaster yeah. jumped out, you know, when he was... Right. 
right. at, a, at a very young right. age along right. the way. From his experience so, in graduate school as well. And, and, and yeah, yeah, writing a, a book, his, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Modestly so, titled uh, Dereliction of Duty. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I actually called him up. I was the executive yeah. of the chairman at the time. First, I had the chairman, I suggested that he buy a copy for all the joint chiefs and have yeah. a discussion of it in the tank, which they did. Mm. But I called him up and I said, you know, this title is a little bit yeah. provocative, and, yeah. you know, especially because some of these guys are still alive. Right, right. Uh, and you might need a little top cover. Yeah. And I will, I'm, I'm going to be here for you yeah. to do that. And yeah. that continued. Yeah. Because, of course, you know, after his brigade command, right. he was right. sent off to the double I, double S in London, the right. think tank. Right. Not, a, not right. an exec to the chairman or right. what have you. Right. And uh, I brought him down to Iraq. Uh, yeah. had him do all these very, very important uh, yeah. assessments that really every single one was brilliant, right. Right. showing again the, the need to keep yeah. him. Yeah. And of course, it's well known that I think yeah. purely coincidentally, of yeah. course, I was the president of the one star promotion board that yeah. year, even yeah. though I was the junior four star in the army. Yeah, I, I would sure, say yeah. one more thing on the, the I have always felt that the army strategist program uh, very which good. does yeah. an admirable job of preparing strategists, right. Right. but they should should be able to command. I don't yeah. understand. Yeah. Why, That's a great point. Why you invest all this in people, right? And yet they get to advise the command, <clears throat> right? But not uh, command. But not command. I That's mean, surely you want the strategists to actually yeah. at least have a shot at command. Right. Now, some right. of them may may not even want that. They want to go down That's an a, academic path. It's a great program. But the idea but, yeah, that you would exactly. not allow them to exactly. Uh, it, and we have a yeah. couple of those. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I think it's at times our FAO program can yeah, exclude do you the from, same the, thing. from the track. Yeah. And, they and used yet, to be able to bounce back and forth, it, it, not anymore. But it very yeah. difficult. And we had yeah. some that, very notable folks right. that, that did that over the years. Right. Uh, General right. Abizade would be one right. of them and some exactly. others, uh, General Ikenberry. Another good question here. We're, uh, we, we, you know, we need more time. We need a couple hours. Not, you know, but uh, Keith uh, had a question. Having now been in the corporate world for a while, which of the four aspects of your framework, strategic framework, uh, does corporate America need to improve on the most? It's a very question. good. It's a very yeah. good question. Yeah. It's because it's probably pieces of all of these. There are people certainly didn't get the big ideas right. Right. Um, the, you know, in the corporate world, it's rare outside of the really large organizations that have their own university. Yeah. Uh, or some of the major right. consulting firms, Deloitte University, we use right. actually. Right. And so forth. Even in a firm as large as ours, you know, we're now managing five hundred and seventy-eight billion dollars. Mm. Mm. Um, it's not quite large enough to have the kind of uh, leader development program right. that is featured in our military. In fact, no other gov government agency even does it. We right. couldn't do it at the CIA. Right. Uh, right. We, we had modest efforts at this, right. but you couldn't fence people. You know, you have an yeah. account. Yeah. Of, yeah. I forget how many exactly. 80 or 90,000 in education sure. account people sure. that are in education at any right. given time. Right. You don't, it's very rare to find that right. in corporation. Right. It's, it's, and it's the first thing they cut. Because sometimes it's hard it often to measure is. the success it, it, of it. It often is. And it takes, yep. Yeah, so, no doubt. Yeah. So, so, again, accepting that, again, they're not getting the formal right. kind of education right. Right. and the whole structured process that the military has, which right. I think is really right. second to none. Which we should be. You know, lives are at stake. We, we should, should be. And know, yet, yeah. And it's not perfect because yeah. their communication yeah. skills exactly. aren't always what they should be, some of the leaders. But, but it's there. Um, but what you do find, frankly, are people the the really effective leaders yeah. are the ones that actually do perform all four tasks right. very admirably. Right. Uh, right. One of the reasons I like the startup world is because I love great young leaders right. who have big ideas that seem to be pretty powerful. Yeah. Usually, they're much more technical than I can understand. But right. It, but the, you, they can uh, describe them very clearly, and you get excited about the prospect yeah. that this individual could build. Uh, our daughter-in-law has a startup. She was Harvard. Hmm. Afghanistan under a rucksack as a female engagement team wow. leader, the inaugural female engagement teams yeah. with the 173rd Airborne Road Scholar, yeah. uh, wow. special wow. ops, civil affairs in those days. Right. Uh, and then she's on her second startup, wow. and it's exciting to watch this yeah. and to see yeah. how, how it goes. That's great. So the ones that are really good, yeah. Reed Hastings at Netflix, or yeah. Jeff Bezos at Amazon, Jack Ma at Alibaba, Reed Hastings, four incarnations. I've discussed this with him of, huh. of, of Netflix. First big idea. We're going to put movies in the hand of customers right. without brick and mortar. Right, right. Put Blockbuster out of business. Yeah. Uh, second big idea. Uh, broadband speeds are fast. Yeah. The context yeah. has changed, so you can now download right. movies. Third big idea. That's the really big one. Is yeah. we're going to make our own content. Yeah. Uh, Hundred million dollars in House of Cards, all the other iconic that's an series. Incredible big idea. And then the fourth point. big idea. Yeah. We're going to make motion major motion pictures. Yeah. We go out and buy not one but two studios. Yeah. And a great metric. They got more Academy Award nominations wow. one wow. year than 
than ever before. Although I did take some issue with Brad right. Pitt playing General McChrystal it was yeah. much too wooden. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just exactly. did, it was his yeah. worst movie ever, and I couldn't yeah. believe he didn't hold out to play me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> But I've talked this uh, through with yeah. Reed, and he has that's, a very similar intellectual Those are construct. great points and great examples. Last question, and I, I hate that. I, I wish we could, like I said, we could keep going for hours, and I think people would keep watching. It's, you know, but uh, Kelly uh, W. has a question on, uh, what does Ukraine tell us about the future of armored and mechanized warfare? It tells, it tells us that there are vulnerabilities yeah. uh, because of, in particular, the unmanned systems. Uh, especially if you're in open terrain, right. and especially if you're trying to breach miles deep right. minefields. Right. Right. Um, what's really interesting about Ukraine is Max Boot captured this brilliantly when he said that Ukraine is, uh, we're all quiet on the Western Front through right. World War One trenches, right. Right. minefields and everything yeah. else, dugouts yeah. and so forth meets Blade Runner Yeah, because you have the futuristic. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, the, the... And you cover that well in the book. That's a great chapter it, on that, how it's... You know, artillery still is dominant. It's, and trench it's still very important. These but that artillery is being adjusted yeah. by drones. Right. That send right. a digital link back yeah. to the FDC, yeah. puts the data on the guns, and is very quick to respond. Yeah, and then you have the amazing. EW fight that's yeah. going on. Yeah. But again, the the challenges with a tank, if you don't have air superiority, right. Right. Are, are, can be pretty substantial. Right. And of course, right. you know, our hopes for the counteroffensive. Our doctrine says you have to have air superiority right. to do that. Right. And they couldn't keep the drones no. off them. And, no, and that's yeah. a major feature. The but, Ukrainians but these, these, are these developing. folks saying the armor's done and all that. That's I don't crazy. think so. No, I mean, they, no, they said that. No way. Yeah. What, what did we do in the Battle of Solder City yeah. uh, in yeah. 2008, yeah. spring? We yeah. rolled the tanks right. and the Bradleys. Right. And by the way, the Bradley yeah. is really doing well on the yes. battlefield. And, yes. and again, uh, so... Better than even I thought. think this yeah. is a back and forth. We yeah. saw, you know, the Yom Kippur yeah. War, the most studied war in history. Yeah. Um, the, the tank initially seemed very vulnerable to the right. ATGMs that the Egyptians had. Right. Uh, and then, lo and behold, Ariel Sharon yeah. encircles yeah. that the Egyptian army is headed to Cairo right. until right. Uh, there is a ceasefire. Yeah. Well, so Sash, there's an offense defense yeah. back and forth no constantly. Doubt. There's a yeah. technology race. We're yeah. seeing it in real time in Ukraine. Right. Uh, Ukraine's producing tens of thousands of drones every month, mm. and they're sending machines whenever they can, rather yeah. than men. They even yeah. have remote controlled machine guns. Wow. Actually, yeah. the problem is they don't haven't figured out how to remotely load them yeah. or or deal with a stoppage. Right. Right. <laughs> so, right. But but again, yeah. the what's going on out there is very yeah. very very worth yeah. watching carefully. Well, and uh, uh, again, you cover that extremely well. I, gosh, we could go on. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. I can't believe it. But I would just say, you know, uh, you put the effort into the book. Get get the book, and uh, you know, this continue. To, thanks for being with us. These examples were just terrific. And well, it's great. Thanks to be for with doing you, the book because it'll help a lot of folks. The you know, the lessons in there and the, the, particularly the strategic level, we, we don't cover it enough. And I, we, hundred more questions. I wish we had more time. And, uh, but well, thanks great, for joining great to be us. with you and a great yeah. to soldier with you one more time. Yeah. Well, uh, thanks, yeah, it's, a, it's an honor. Yeah, absolutely. I really appreciate it. So thanks so much. And well, you know, uh, before I part, I want to inform viewers of a few upcoming events. Uh, next week will be the land forces Pacific symposium, 32 Indo-Pacific nations there. It'll be great. And, uh, in Hawaii. Looking forward to that. We'll have an AUSA coffee series featuring uh, Lieutenant General Carl Gingrich, the Deputy Chief of Staff G8 on 21 May. You won't want to miss that. 6 June, we'll host a noon report featuring James Lechner, author of With My Shield, an Army Ranger in Somalia. And that's uh, fascinating. And that's on 6 June. 25 June, another uh, noon report uh, featuring the Honorable uh, Rachel Jacobson, Assistant Secretary of the Army for Installations, Energy, and Environment. And again, that, that'll be a, a great experience. Don't miss it. Hope you can join us for an upcoming upcoming webinar or event. And for more information on any of these events or to register, uh, please visit our website at ausa.org. Finally, we thank all of you who support us with your membership. Over a million and a half members strong right now. Join the team that supports our Army. Thanks again to General Petraeus for being here. Thank you for joining us and attending. Have a great Army Day.